uh, thank you for the, the invitation um, and for, for organizing um, this great virtual seminar. The first thing I'll point out is I don't usually um, give talks over Zoom using the technological I'm setup I'm using right now. And I can't see any of you. So I can't see any of your faces or the chat. Um, if at any point you have questions or you want me to elaborate on something, please just feel free to unmute yourself and shout at me and I will uh, do my best to, to answer your questions. Yes. So, so for instance, at this very moment, we, we are only seeing a black screen. Oh, um, that's a big problem. Yes. Now we're um, seeing your slides, but they're small. How did it went? So I suppose you're trying to use two screens, right? No, I'm just using my, my laptop. Usually how I do this is I use my iPad, but that requires me to do something strange. I'm wondering how if I can just uh, get rid of this somehow. All right. Yeah. Is that good enough? Can you can you see the slides yep. now? Yeah, okay. that's well, we'll have to do it this way. And yeah, uh, that'll work fine. Okay. I still can't see the chat, but now I can see myself, which is disconcerting. Okay, um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about some domination problems. Um, eventually, we'll get to um, JK domination, um, but I just want to start with um, straightforward domination. So I'm going to start by talking to you a little bit about um, domination and efficient domination and some uh, classic results, um, and uh, we'll move on from there. So in case you're um, unfamiliar, you've sort of forgotten from your, uh, your graph theory course, um, a dominating set uh, is a set, a subset of vertices in your graph so that every vertex is um, uh, outside of the set is, has some neighbor inside the set. Um, and it's important, important to sort of clarify the terminology because if you read through the literature on domination, you'll find that different people have a different idea of what a dominating set should be. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, parallel terminology and overloaded terminology. Um, but so for me, a dominating set um, is a set in which every vertex dominates itself as well as its neighbors. Um, and if you're thinking about dominating sets, sort of the, um, the natural kind of question is the optimization question. So every graph has a dominating set. You take all the vertices. Now you want to find a dominating set with minimum size or minimum weight. Um, and you can play with that idea quite a lot. Um, I'm not going to play with that idea at all. I'm going to look at something slightly different. So an, a dominating set is efficient um, if uh, this is the case. So every vertex is dominated exactly once, either by itself or by uh, some vertex it is adjacent to. Um, and if you're looking at efficient dominating sets, um, now it's no longer the case that every graph is going to have an efficient dominating set. So some graphs will have efficient dominating sets, some won't. And the question becomes, well, when does a graph have an efficient dominating set? If you're still thinking about this in terms of the optimization problem, um, then you can think about the dual problem. So the dual problem to domination is packing. I want to find a set of vertices in my graph so that their closed neighborhoods are disjoint from each other and I want to find as large a set as possible. Um, and if you think about this efficient domination condition, what you notice is that you have an efficient dominating uh, set exactly when you have a perfect um, packing of these closed neighborhoods. Um, so here are two uh, explicit examples. I've taken the cube Q3, and uh, on the left here, these blue vertices are a dominating set. Uh, every vertex is either in the set or has a neighbor in the set. And Q3 happens to have an efficient dominating set. Uh, this set of red vertices here gives you an efficient dominating set. You see that every vertex is adjacent to exactly one element in the set or is in the set itself. Um, so we can translate these definitions into linear algebra, which I'm going to do. Um, so first off, I'm sort of going to talk interchangeably about functions and sets. So I apologize if that's confusing. I'll try to talk about functions mostly, except when it's sort of more expedient to talk about sets. Um, so of course, you can turn every subset of vertices in your graph into a function uh, simply by using the indicator function for that subset. And now our uh, efficient dominating set condition in terms of this function um, becomes exactly this. So I have uh, this system of equations, uh, the adjacency matrix of my graph plus the identity. So the rows of this matrix are giving you the characteristic vectors of the closed neighborhoods. Um, and then I take the product with this vector that I get by taking my function values. Um, and that should be equal to the all ones vector. 
Um, so now that we've translated the idea into linear algebra, we can um, apply our, our basic observations or basic knowledge about systems of equations. Um, so I see that in order for my graph to have an efficient dominating function, this system def definitely has to be consistent. Um, it's not enough for the system to be consistent. Um, I need, I'm looking for very special solutions to the system of equations, um, but I definitely need it to be consistent. Um, I also can notice that if I have more than one efficient dominating function, um, then uh, those functions are going to be linearly dependent as vectors. Um, and in that case, uh, negative one must be an eigenvector of my graph. Um, and if my graph is regular and all the graphs we're going to look at more or less in this talk are going to be regular, um, then the system is always consistent. Um, and that means that I have uh, an efficient dominating function. Um, if I have an efficient dominating function, then negative one must be um, an eigenvalue. And we're gonna sort of use this um, eigenvalue condition uh, throughout mostly implicitly. So I should also give you some, some examples. Um, so here's some fairly trivial examples, but they're sort of worth thinking about. Um, so first off, we're gonna use this quite a bit. So the complete graph obviously has efficient dominating functions. Negative one is an eigenvalue with large multiplicity. And we see that we have all sorts of um, efficient dominating sets. I take any vertex and that does the trick. If I look at the graph K and N, you can work out by hand pretty quickly that there can't be an efficient dominating set or a function in this graph. Um, and if you look at the eigenvalues, lo and behold, you see that this is a regular graph and negative one isn't an eigenvalue. Um, so you shouldn't have had to work it out by hand. And then we have a, a slightly more interesting case if you look at cycles. Um, so you can show pretty easily that a cycle has an efficient dominating function if and only if three divides the order of your cycle. And it just so happens that that's exactly when uh, negative one is an eigenvalue uh, of your cycle. And then finally, here's this graph that looks a lot like the cube, but I've sort of switched some edges around. Uh, and if you look at this graph, you can see again pretty easily that there is no efficient dominating function in this graph. Um, so for instance, if you assign one to this vertex in the corner here, um, that covers these three vertices here. Um, so in order to cover this vertex, um, I would need to select either uh, this vertex, this vertex, or this vertex, um, or actually this vertex is fine as well. And no matter which one you select, you're gonna get a contradiction, you're not efficient. Um, and this is an interesting example because here negative one is an eigenvalue of this graph, it's regular, and it doesn't have an efficient dominating function. So this is just an illustration that um, the eigenvalue condition really is a, a necessary condition and not a, um, a sufficient condition, regardless of what my previous three examples might have led you to believe. So the, the result that I want to tell you about uh, is a result for Hamming graphs. So I'm going to introduce those now um, and talk a little bit about efficient domination for Hamming graphs before we um, see them later on. So hopefully you've all seen these graphs before, um, but here's a quick uh, definition in case you haven't. Um, so the Hamming graph of order D on Q symbols, I'm going to call this HQD. And rather unfortunately, when I was preparing for this talk, I was flipping through one of Chris's books and noticed that he uses these parameters in a different order. <laughs> so I apologize to everybody again immediately off the bat for uh, introducing that unnecessary confusion. Um, but this is simply the, the graph on uh, ZQ to the D where, um, so the Cayley graph where my connection set is um, any multiple of these standard basis vectors. So here I'm using um, E sub I to represent um, sort of the, the string of, of digits where um, the ith digit is one and all the other digits are zero. And then I'm replacing that one by an A for all A between one and Q minus one. Um, now for most of the, the talk, I'm gonna be looking at um, the case where this, uh, this object here is a finite vector space. In that case, so I can really talk about the, um, the standard basis and its multiples without, um, without confusion. Um, now, the problem of finding efficient dominating functions on Hamming graphs um, is really, really well studied because um, these things are perfect codes. So back in the, um, I don't know, 50s, 60s, when people were um, really looking for uh, perfect codes, good codes for communications, and um, trying to characterize uh, the existence of perfect codes, um, sort of all of that work, although it's phrased in terms of uh, subspaces of vector spaces, can be equally phrased in terms of efficient dominating functions on Hamming graphs. So some highlights of that, that theory. Um, 
so first off, I would point out that um, you know, around the same time when people were looking at, uh, at codes in vector spaces, um, people also started looking at uh, codes and perfect codes in graphs. Uh, so this is from 1973. Uh, a perfect E code in a graph is a subset so that every vertex uh, of my set is at distance at most E from exactly one vertex uh, in my set. And of course, if you replace E by one, you get exactly our condition. So this is really talking about, um, so perfect E code in a graph is going to be a, an efficient dominating function uh, in some sort of uh, auxiliary graph constructed from the, the distance um, uh, the distance function on your original graph. Now the, the, the most important theorem for us is um, this theorem of, I'm going to call it Van Lint uh, et al, because Van Lint is the only name I'm con confident I can pronounce. Um, and so this theorem basically tells you when you have um, perfect one codes in uh, the Hamming graph HQD, where Q is a prime power. Um, now this, this theorem is slightly sloppily stated. Um, you can, you should really say that uh, I'm looking for a non-trivial code, um, but except in a few small cases that will coincide exactly here. So the theorem says if Q is a prime power, then this graph contains a perfect one code if and only if um, its order D is of this specific form. So I have some power of Q minus one divided by Q minus one. Um, and not only are these the graphs that contain perfect one codes, um, but all of the perfect one codes in these graphs have sort of the same parameters and uh, the linear examples are exactly the Hamming codes. So if you took a course in, uh, in coding theory or if you've, you've studied coding theory at all, um, you'll have come across uh, Hamming codes and how to construct them. And this theorem says that in these, these graphs, your perfect one codes are exactly these, these Hamming codes. So, there's another way to, or there's not another way to think about these things, but this, this theorem has a, um, a nice corollary that um, I hadn't seen before until recently, so I'd like to, to share it with you. Um, and it involves uh, covers. So in general, if I have um, a graph Y, then a graph X is said to be a cover of Y or a B-fold cover. Um, if I can partition the vertices of my graph X into subsets corresponding to the vertices of the graph Y that I'm covering. So I have these sets C sub U, where U ranges over the vertices of Y. Um, and this partition satisfies the following conditions. Um, so kind of most importantly, if I look at um, the edges between any two of these sets, C sub U and C sub V, then I see either exactly a perfect matching or no edges at all. And I see a perfect matching when U V is an edge of the graph I'm covering. And I see no edges when UV is not a, a, an edge of the graph I'm covering. Um, so, I mean, in particular, implicitly in this definition, um, these uh, C sub U's are independent sets. And of course, they all have the same size, well, provided your graph is connected. Um, that will follow immediately from point two. Um, and here's an example. So here's an example that we've been looking at already. Um, so here's our Q3. And if you look at the red vertices, that's exactly the, um, the efficient one dominating function that we started with on the very first slide. Um, and this efficient one dominating function, you can think of as the Hamming code in Q3. So you can think of this vertex here as zero and this vertex here as one, one, one. Um, and then if you look at the translates of this code via the, um, the standard basis vectors, so if I translate in the, the vertical direction, these blue vertices turn into the, sorry, these red vertices turn into the blue vertices. Um, if I translate in the horizontal direction, um, my red vertices turn into the black vertices. And if I translate in the diagonal direction, my red vertices turn into the brown vertices. So I get this nice partition into four sets. And it turns out that um, these four sets give me a two cover of the complete graph K4. Um, so if you look at this kind of redrawn picture of the cube in a very strange way, uh, you'll notice that I get um, one set for each of my colors. Um, the set has size two, I have exactly four of them. Um, K4 doesn't have any non-edges, but these sets are independent. And if I look between any two of them, I see uh, a perfect matching. Um, so this is a really nice paper of, of Lee um, from 2001 um, that uh, sort of 
derives a very nice connection between these covers of the complete graph and uh, efficient dominating functions in Cayley graphs for abelian groups. So in particular, um, Hamming graphs are Cayley graphs for an abelian group, and we're looking at um, these efficient dominating functions. Um, so this tells us something about those. So this theorem at least says, if you have a Cayley graph for an abelian group and you look at any efficient uh, one dominating function or any efficient, efficient one dominating set, um, then, so first off, that set is independent in your Cayley graph. And when you look at the translates of that set via the connection set elements, you get a partition of the, the vertices of your graph. Um, and that partition gives you a cover of a complete graph of the corresponding size. So the example that I showed you a moment ago with uh, Q3 in the Hamming code um, isn't an accident. This sort of, this will happen um, whenever you have a, an efficient dominating function um, in a Cayley graph for an abelian group. So this is sort of the, the starting point of what I want to, to talk about um, uh, today. Um, and sort of, I, I want to generalize this um, kind of as much as we can. So the first thing I want to do is I want to try to generalize um, everything I've just said to um, K domination. So now I'm looking um, for sets that dominate every vertex more than once. And I'm sort of lingering here for a moment because when I first started looking at this, I saw this theorem of Lee, this, this beautiful paper, and I thought, oh, I wonder if we can just um, kind of fiddle with the parameters a bit and extend all of this theory um, in, into a nice generalization. Um, and the first thing you notice is that, well, I mean, the first thing you do is you struggle with it for a while, and then eventually you notice that you're not going to be successful. Um, and the reason why is in order for this theorem to work, I really need this set has to be an independent set. Um, the fact that it's an independent set is what's allowing me to translate it around and get a nice partition. If my set has some edges in it, then when I try to translate it by connection set elements, I'm going to run into problems. Um, and I'm going to need some edges to be in it if I'm going to have a dominating set that dominates every vertex more than once. So let's, let's start this generalization process. Um, so let's look at efficient K domination. And the first thing to do is give you a definition. You'll notice that this is exactly the same definition that I put on the first slide, um, except here, instead of one, I now have, I'm not sure if you can see, can you see my cursor? Yeah, okay. um, so instead of, of ones, we have Ks. So I've done the obvious thing in generalizing or extending this definition. I shouldn't say I've done it, people have done it. Um, so again, you can look for K dominating sets now um, you're going to have to be a little bit careful with your value of K in order for your graph to have an efficient, uh, sorry, in order to have for your graph to have a K dominating set. But as long as your, your value of K is something sensible, your graph will typically have a K dominating set and you can look at the optimization problem. Um, but again, we're going to look at the, um, the efficient K dominating sets. So what I want is a subset of the vertices in my graph um, so that the intersection of uh, any closed neighborhood um, with my subset is exactly K, has a size exactly K. And again, uh, we can kind of translate in that, that into a statement about linear algebra. I can instead look at these zero one indicator functions and I'm looking for solutions to the system of equations. Um, and just as before, if I'm looking at a regular graph, then the system is always consistent. And again, um, I'm only going to have uh, K dominating functions uh, if negative one is an eigenvalue. So, so some uh, examples, some salient examples. Um, so again, if you think about complete graphs, you get sort of lots and lots of, of um, efficient dominating sets for any sane value of K. Uh, if you take any subset of the vertices, that's going, that subset is going to satisfy um, the definition on the previous slide um, for the corresponding value of K. Um, another thing to notice is that if we think of that theorem of Lee, um, if I look at, uh, sort of this nice cover of the complete graph. And now inst so inst instead of picking a subset of the vertices of the complete graph, I'm taking the union of um, the sets in, or the, the fibers in this cover um, corresponding to a subset of the vertices in the complete graph. And just as the, the subset of the vertices of the complete graph gave me an efficient uh, K dominating set, so too is this union. And so here's an example, again, uh, Q3. Here I have our familiar um, one dominating set. 
Here I've taken the union of two of the translates of that set. Um, and you notice that it gives you a, uh, a two dominating function, sorry, an efficient two dominating function. Here I have an efficient three dominating function. And then at the very end, I have the, the obvious and, and trivial. Um, I take all the vertices and that I get a, a, a four dominating function. So to, to generalize this idea, this is sort of the, um, the main object I'm going, to, I'm going to use in place of a cover. So instead of looking for covers, I'm going to look at these things I'll call K covers. Um, and so this is again, just the definition of cover uh, modified in the obvious way. Uh, so X is a K cover of Y. If again, I'm partitioning the vertices of my graph X into sets corresponding to the vertices of Y. And now my conditions become uh, the induced subgraphs for each of these sets uh, gives me some K minus one regular graph. Um, they don't have to be isomorphic, but they all have to be K minus one regular. Um, instead of looking at a, for perfect matchings between the, um, the sets CU and CV, um, I want to have a K regular bipartite graph between CU and CV um, whenever UV is an edge of Y, and when uh, UV is not an edge of Y, that I have no edges between um, CU and CV. So I'm going to give you kind of uh, a, an important example in, in just a second, but I, I feel I should give you some examples. And um, again, you can kind of think there's, there's trivial examples you can come up with immediately if you take um, any large complete graph and partition its vertices into sets of the same size, then you're going to get one of these um, covers in kind of a trivial way. But let's look at a, a non-trivial example. So this slide has uh, an insane amount of writing on it. <laughs> I apologize for that. I really try not to do this, but in going through this example, this example is kind of important. And there was sort of only one way I could fit all of the information onto a slide in a sensible way. So let's go through it slowly. I'm not going to force you to speed read this, as I say, trivially, when we have this. <laughs> um, so what I'm looking at is I'm looking at the 11 cube. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct a cover of the 3 cube. And the way I'm going to do it is, is pretty straightforward, but so let's just fix some terminology. Um, so my 11 cube, I'm going to treat the generators of this. So the generators um, for my paleograph is just the, the standard basis. So again, I'm taking my EIs to be the standard basis vectors. I'm also going to want to refer to the standard basis vectors of Q3 uh, for Q3. And I'm going to call those F sub J's instead of E sub I's. Now, um, I want a map from, I want a linear transformation from Z2 to the 11 to Z2 to the three. And I'm gonna use that transformation to define my cover. And the way you construct this transformation is actually um, pretty arbitrary. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically pick two of these um, E sub I's, take whichever ones you want um, and map them to zero. And that leaves me with nine elements left in my standard basis. And I'm just going to take an arbitrary partition of those vectors into three sets of size three. And I'm going to map uh, each of those sets to uh, one of my standard basis vectors in Q3. So I've, I've made a, an explicit choice here. Um, mainly, I made this choice basically because it was the most um, uh, efficient to write down in terms of notation. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm mapping E10 and E11 to zero, and I'm mapping um, F3, F6, X, F9, sorry, E3, E6, E9 to F3, um, et cetera. Um, so I have this, this, uh, this linear transformation. So once I've defined my function on these, on these bases, I can just extend linearly. Um, and I'm going to look at um, this set T of vertices in my 11 cube. So T is going to be the pre-image of a subspace um, in Q3. And the subspace I'm going to take is uh, the Hamming code, and that's not an accident. Um, so I'm looking at this set 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1, and I'm looking at all of the vectors that map to these. Um, and in order to figure out exactly what those are, um, all I need to do is find an element that maps to um, each element of a basis for this space, and then take a basis for the kernel of my transformation. So if I'm looking for a basis for this subspace, well, it's just the vector 1, 1, 1. Um, and you can easily find a vector that maps to 1, 1, 1. So for instance, this vector here, E1 plus E2 plus E3, E1 maps to F1, E2 maps to F2, E3 maps to F3. So this vector gets mapped to 1, 1, 1. And the rest of this here is, a, is, a, is the kernel of my, my transformation pretty much. So E10 and E11 are obviously mapped to zero. 
and then to figure out what's happening here. So notice that if I have, if, for instance, if we look at E3, E6, and E9, they're all mapped to F3. Um, so when does kind of what combination of those vectors maps to zero? Well, if I see any two, then I get F3 plus F3, which gives me zero. So that's exactly what this is saying. So this is saying that I should take the span of E3 plus E6, E6 plus E9, and E3 plus E9. If I'm looking for a basis, then those three vectors are dependent, and any two of them generates the third. So if I want to find the dimension of this space um, to get a basis, I would take E10 and E11. I would take two uh, basis elements from uh, each of these three sets. That would give me a total of eight. And I take this vector and that gives me nine. So I'm looking at a, a subspace of, uh, of Z2 to the 11 of dimension nine. And I can look at its cosets. Its cosets are going to be um, itself, T0. Um, the shift by uh, the standard basis vector E1, the shift by E2, and the shift by E3. Um, so this gives me my partition. And notice that phi is mapping um, these sets to um, the translates of my Hamming code. So here I have my Hamming code, the translate by 001, the translate by 010, and the translate by 100. Um, and then we'll come back to these. So I should verify that this is actually a three cover. And to do that, I need to um, look at uh, what's happening with the edges here. So if I look at uh, any of these sets, say T0, if I look at the, um, the, uh, the, induced sub the subgraph induced by T0, um, the edges in that subgraph are going to correspond to exactly um, the standard basis elements that are in my subspace. And again, it's not too hard to see that uh, oops, E10 and E11, E10 and E11, um, are the only standard basis vectors that are in T0. So I get this nice two regular subgraph. And in fact, uh, I get isomorphic two regular subgraphs for all of these translates. Um, and then also between um, any two of my fibers, I see that um, I'm going to get the set of edges uh, corresponding to exactly one of these uh, vectors F sub J. So I get the, the preimage of, of these F sub Js, and that's exactly three of my standard basis vectors. Um, so I see that uh, I get these two regular subgraphs, and between those subgraphs, I have a three regular bipartite graph. Um, so indeed, I have this nice three cover of Q3, and of course, composing that um, function with any um, cover of the uh, complete graph K4 uh, by Q3 um, gives me a three cover of K4. So that was a pretty long example, but um, uh, there's a reason why I wanted to spend a lot of time on that. Um, and that is that this construction um, sort of basically proves the result that I, I wanted to show you. So the question is, um, if I give you a Hamming graph, um, what, uh, uh, what efficient K dominating functions does it have? Or sort of for what values of K does it have an efficient K dominating function? So let's kind of think for a moment about um, what has to be true. So we've already seen that in order to have an efficient K-dominating function, I definitely have to have negative one as an eigenvalue. Um, and then I also have this, um, this simple uh, divisibility condition. So if I have any R regular graph uh, with N vertices, and I'm looking for an efficient K-dominating set where K is somewhere between one and R, and the reason why I've, I've chosen these limits is, well, obviously if K is zero, then that's not interesting. Um, and if k is r plus 1, that's also not interesting. If I take all the vertices, um, I'm guaranteed to get a, an efficient r plus 1 dominating set. So I'm really interested in these values of k between 1 and r. Um, and I see my, my necessary conditions are that I, I must have negative 1 as an eigenvalue. And I must have that r plus 1 divides um, n times k. And to see why this is the case, um, we just do a simple count. So suppose I have an efficient k dominating set s. And I want to look at each vertex and count up the total amount of domination. So I can do that by looking at all of the vertices, so all of my n vertices. Each of them is dominated exactly k times. So the total amount of domination is n times k. The other way to do this counting is to notice that I only need to count, uh, well, I can also count the amount of domination done by each vertex. And to do that, I will count over my set s, and each element uh, in my set s contributes r plus 1. So in order to have an efficient K-dominating set, I need uh, the size of S to be an integer. So I need R plus 1 to divide N times K. And now the, um, the nice kind of partial theorem that I have is, 
um, that these necessary conditions are sufficient, at least some of the time. Um, so first off, let's look at um, HPD. So if P is any prime, um, then if you look at the, the second condition, the divisibility condition, um, so here, this is the degree of my Hamming graph. This is degree plus one. Because P is a prime, I can look at the prime factorization of this number, whatever it is. So I can express this as P to the A times M, where M is not divisible by P. And now if this value divides the size of my graph, which is P to the power D times K, um, the only way for that to happen is if M divides K. So that divisibility condition turns into K must be a multiple of whatever value M this is. And we can find an efficient dominating function for all of these multiples. So that necessary condition is sufficient in the case where P is a prime. Um, if Q is a prime power, then uh, the construction that I, I outlined still works just as well. Um, however, now we have to be a little bit careful with this divisibility condition. Um, but I'll, I'll say more about that um, a little bit later. Uh, first, let's look at the, the proof of this theorem. So I'm just joking, I'm not actually gonna show you a proof, but I'm basically gonna point out that um, I already did show you a proof. Um, that extremely tedious example that I went through um, is the construction that makes all of this work. So if we go back to Q11, then um, I'm looking at the prime two, my D is 11. I can factor um, two minus one times 11 plus one, which is the degree plus one. Um, that's 12, so that factors as two to the power of two times three. So in the previous statement, my A is two and my M is three. And the theorem says I should be able to construct um, efficient K dominating functions for every K a multiple of M. And the way I do that is by using this cover. So notice that once I have this nice, um, this nice K cover, of, sorry, this nice three cover of K4, um, if I take any set in that cover, that gives me an efficient three dominating function. If I take the union of any two sets, that gives me a, a six dominating function. If I take the union of any three, it gives me a nine dominating function. If I take all of them, it gives me the, um, the not so interesting uh, 12 dominating function. And this will work equally well for any prime P in any degree D. In fact, it works equally well for any prime power Q in any D, D. I don't know why I said that. Slightly losing my mind, I think. That's what happens when you don't ask questions of your speaker. Um, okay, so, so what happens when, um, when Q is a prime power? Where does this all break? Um, well, it's not that it breaks. It's just the, the divisibility condition it doesn't work out nearly as cleanly. Um, so our, our two necessary conditions are the same as they were before. Negative one has to be an eigenvalue. And this is now the divisibility condition. So Q to the D is the order of my graph. K is the, um, the value for the efficient dominating function I'm trying to construct. And this is degree plus one. Um, and just notice that it's, it's, this eigenvalue condition is sort of, um, it's not that, that difficult. It's easy to work out when exactly um, this graph is going to have negative one as an eigenvalue. It's gonna be exactly when D is con uh, congruent to one mod Q. Um, so the sort of this divisibility condition is, is the, the real sticking point. Um, and so if you're thinking of prime powers, then your first test case would be to look at two to the power of two. It's uh, the smallest prime power I can think of, uh, but it's not prime. Um, and so you can just kind of try and, and look for these, these efficient dominating functions. Um, so if, in order to satisfy the eigenvalue condition, um, D is going to be uh, a multiple of four plus one. So we can look at when D is equal to five. When D is equal to five, um, I can factor um, the degree of this graph plus one nicely as four squared times one. And if you do this construction, what you get is a, a cover of K16. And in fact, this is just the, the Hamming graph in, um, for, um, for these orders. Sorry, the uh, Hamming code for these orders. Um, so this is sort of, this is the classical result. Um, when D is equal to nine, Again, you can, you can do this factorization and M is equal to seven and you think, well, I, I should be able to construct um, a, uh, an efficient K dominating function for any multiple of seven. And indeed you can. Um, the same construction gives you a seven cover of K4. And not only do you get all the multiples of seven, but um, the divisibility condition is exactly that Q must be a multiple of seven. So here 
4, 4, and 9, the theorem is that these um, conditions are uh, necessary and sufficient still. When d is equal to 13, something unpleasant happens. And that is when you do this factorization of 3d plus 1, you can pull out the highest power of 4 you can, but you're left with some even number. So you can still do the, the construction. So you can still get your 10 cover of k4. Um, and that's going to allow you to construct um, efficient k dominating functions for k equal to 10, 20, or 30. Um, however, the divisibility condition is now that a k has to be divisible by 5. Um, so I'm missing a whole bunch of dominating functions. Um, I would hope I would be able to find an efficient um, 5 dominating function, 15, 25, 35. Um, but so far I haven't. Um, and this is sort of uh, also kind of annoying because uh, at this point you might try some experimentation, um, except this graph is, is well outside the, um, my ability to experiment. I'm not sure about yours. <laughs> Uh, this is a pretty large graph. Um, and uh, because I'm in the mood for sticking my neck out, um, uh, I'll, I'll go so far as to, to conjecture that um, those, uh, those efficient dominating functions um, really are missing. They, they sort of, they should be there. I, I think they should be there. Um, morally, they should definitely be there. Um, whether or not they are is, is another question. Um, Another question that might have occurred to you is, well, what if we just go back to the Hamming graphs themselves and, and not look at primes or prime powers? Well, what's so special about prime powers? Um, and you can definitely do that. So some of what I said will still work. Um, uh, actually, was, as I was drafting these, these slides, it occurred to me that I, I hadn't really thought hard enough about this construction um, when Q is, is uh, some composite number. Um, I think it's possible that uh, uh, the things that I, the theory that I'm using for vector spaces, I mean, enough of the same things are true about modules that I can maybe get this to work in exactly the same way, which would be nice. Um, but uh, I'm still going to run into the same problem of uh, this divisibility condition not working out nearly as nicely when um, Q is a composite number as compared to when it's a prime number. Um, and of course, you expect it to get sort of much, much worse. Um, so if you sort of think about, well, what's the first interesting case to consider, it would be um, when Q is equal to six. Um, and then for these small values, um, again, I, th I think the construction should probably still work. Um, but as soon as you get to um, 19, again, you get a, a problem with divisibility that's going to cause you a headache. Um, I should also point out that sort of one of the reasons why I didn't um, think so hard about uh, composite orders um, is for prime power orders, we have this beautiful theory of uh, perfect codes that you can leverage, which is essentially what I've been doing. Um, when you start looking at uh, non-prime power orders, now you're looking at sort of uh, the analogous objects are codes over rings as opposed to over um, fields. And uh, much, much less is known about those um, for pretty good reason. I mean, um, I, I doesn't seem that they have nearly the application. And certainly they don't have the, as the obvious application that, that codes over fields do. Okay. So how are we doing on time? Oh, I've got some time left. Um, okay, so I should really at least talk a little bit about the title of my talk. Um, that seems like a good thing to do in general. Um, so I, I wanna say a, th a few things about efficient JK domination. I'm not actually gonna say very much. Um, so the, the main um, point that I wanted to communicate was this, this theorem about, um, about Hamming graphs. Um, but what is, what is efficient JK domination? So actually, this is sort of how I first came to all these problems. Um, I'm sh pretty sure I saw domination in graphs when I was a student, but uh, it, it was never the, the focus of any graph theory course I took. Um, and I'd, I'd sort of forgotten about it. I mean, I don't, I don't really work very much in this field. Um, I've only started looking at these problems you know, a couple of years ago. Um, and the reason why I started looking at them was I went to a, a seminar presentation, actually, um, at the University of Victoria given by Gary McGillivary. And he was talking about um, efficient JK domination. And I thought, oh, that sounds like a, uh, an interesting generalization. I wonder, I wonder how much I can, I can work out about these things. What I should go and, and play with them and, and apply all the things I know from algebraic graph theory um, and see if I can make any progress anywhere. So what is uh, efficient JK domination? So this is an idea that's introduced by uh, Rubel, Kaba, and Slater in a paper in 2008. And it sort of gives the... Um, a generalization of efficient domination 
in two directions. So the first direction is the K part, which we've already seen. So instead of just talking about uh, one domination, I'm talking about K domination. To generalize in the other direction, now instead of looking at sets, I'm really gonna look at zero one functions and I'm gonna generalize this to um, say zero one two functions or zero one two three four, et cetera, up to J functions. So I'm assigning each vertex in my graph a value between uh, zero and J. And my dominating condition is that the sum of the function values on any closed neighborhood has to be at least K. And then of course, the efficient version of this is to replace this inequality with the equality. Um, and again, you can look at uh, the optimization problem if you're, if you're trying to find um, uh, JK dominating functions of minimum weight. Um, again, you have to be a little bit careful with your values of J and K to make sure that your, the graphs you're looking at do have JK dominating functions before you start looking at trying to optimize them. Um, but again, I'm, I'm really mostly concerned about the efficient problem, the efficient, efficient JK dominating function problem. So when, when does a graph have one of these functions? And again, you can think about this in terms of, of linear algebra. So again, I'm just looking for um, a solution to the system, but I'm now looking for a, a solution with a slightly different form. Instead of a, a zero one valued solution, I'm looking for a, a solution whose values all lie in this set of, of numbers from zero to J. Um, and one of the nice consequences of, of generalizing in this way is um, now the eigenvalue condition for regular graphs becomes a, a sufficient condition. Um, if you sort of uh, kind of bend your mind around what, what the problem we're actually looking at a little bit. Um, so here, I, I mean, it's sufficient in that um, if your graph is regular, then there's some value of J and some value of K um, uh, for which uh, this graph has an efficient JK dominating function, if and only if negative one um, is an eigenvalue for your graph. And this is a nice, um, this is a nice problem for your linear algebra students, actually. This is, um, this is pretty straightforward. Um, So, uh, actually, how much do I want to say? So again, if, if we're thinking about um, sort of the stuff that I, I talked about already, um, looking at, at efficient one dominating functions and sort of relating them to covers of the complete graph, and then looking at efficient k dominating functions and relating to them to these k covers, um, sort of the the actual concept that's hiding in the background is equitable partitions. So uh, covers and k covers, at least as I've looked at them, are uh, equitable partitions of a, of a particular type. Um, and if I, I want to look for efficient JK dominating functions in a regular graph, one of the games you can play is to look for um, equitable partitions that are amenable, that kind of play well with this definition. What I want to do is I want to be able to partition the vertices of my graph into subsets and assign function values to those subsets. Uh, assign each, each set of value in one to J, however you like. Um, and end up with efficient JK dominating functions. Um, so to do that, um, you just need a, to, uh, to work out exactly what condition you want on your equitable partitions. So these are just some definitions that I'm sure everybody um, in the seminar is very familiar with. Um, so an equitable partition is a partition of the vertex setting your graph so that um, if you look at any uh, vertex in C sub I, um, the number of neighbors it has in any C sub J depends only on the indices I uh, and J. And uh, from this partition, you can construct uh, its characteristic matrix. Um, so uh, here I'm just taking the values of this matrix to be the number of neighbors of U in CI that lie in CJ. Um, and of course, anytime you're looking at equal partitions, the, um, the, the flashing red light that should be going off in your mind is you should really be thinking about eigenvalues and, and eigenspaces. Um, and the reason why is because uh, if you look at the characteristic matrix for any equal partition of any graph, um, then uh, its characteristic polynomial divides the characteristic polynomial of your uh, adjacency matrix. So the eigenvalues of your, your um, partition associated to your partition are eigenvalues of your graph. And you also get a connection between um, eigenvectors as well. So if you look at this paper by Rubikawa and Slater, um, they talk a little bit about efficient K-dominating sets in regular graphs. And they don't phrase it like this because they don't mention equitable partitions, but this is what they're talking about. So they make the observation that um, if you have a, an efficient K-dominating set, then you, you have an equitable partition with two parts um, and its eigenvalues are uh, negative one and the valency of your graph. 
And of course, once you have this partition into two parts, you can take either part as your dominating set and you will get different K dominating sets. So you have a, a, an efficient K dominating set as well as an efficient R minus K plus one dominating set. And sort of the way you, you generalize this um, is as follows. So I'll call an equal partition uh, dominatable um, if it is equitable and there are these parameters or these values um, A1 through AL so that if you look at the number of neighbors of some vertex in CI in CJ, um, this is going to be exactly AI minus one if I and J are the same, and it's going to be exactly AJ whenever else. So this is fine, this gives you a subset of, of equitable partitions. And notice that if you go back to the, the equitable partition that I, I, um, I mentioned a moment ago in the previous theorem, um, that sort of, this is a, a direct generalization of that condition. Um, and why do I call these things dominatable? Um, well, if you have a partition of this form, you can do exactly what I said. Um, if you have this partition, you can ascribe values to your partite sets, however you like. And if you look at the sum over all of the closed neighborhoods, you always get the same value. And it's going to be the sum of um, the values, your, your, your function values together with um, uh, these parameters, A, A1 through AL. And in particular, if you, um, if you take your alpha i's to be in the set zero and one, um, then you get exactly efficient uh, k-dominating functions, these things that we were looking at before. And of course, if you're looking for examples of, of um, dominatable partitions, um, then any of the covers that we looked at or the k-covers that we looked at are going to give you examples. Um, I also have some other examples, but they're just for, sort of for sporadic graphs. So I didn't, um, I didn't put them anywhere on the slide. Um, so you can kind of, uh, uh, again, kind of see what we can say in general. And um, well, the answer is, is uh, I can't say very much as of yet, but certainly if you kind of, again, parse this definition through um, linear algebra, you notice that uh, if, your partition, if your partition is dominatable, then if you look at its characteristic matrix plus the identity, um, you're looking at a matrix of rank one. And you can express this as an outer product where um, you have this, uh, the all ones vector and this vector of these values A1 through AL. So the eigenvalues of this matrix are um, the, uh, the, the degree of your graph, um, the valency of your graph, and then negative one for the rest of the values. And uh, you know, one sort of nice observation is that these dominatable partitions are characterized by these eigenvalues. If you see an equitable partition where the only eigenvalues are the valence of your graph and negative one, then that partition is dominatable. Um, however, it's, it's not the case. So uh, just as before, when we were looking at um, negative, the uh, negative one as an eigenvalue as a, a necessary condition. Again, the multiplicity here is a necessary condition, not a sufficient condition. So just because you have a graph that has negative one with, with large valence, with large multiplicity, um, doesn't mean you should expect to see partitions of this form. Okay, so that's, that's basically all I wanted to say. So here are sort of the, um, the natural questions leading on. Um, so I'll add sort of from the first part of the talk, um, there's this conjecture that I would like to, to be able to resolve at some point. It might be a, a bit of a, a long shot. Um, but also I, I sort of uh, have questions about this, this idea that I've given to you. I haven't really given you any results, but this um, idea of dominatable partitions and sort of what we can say about them in particular, um, for what graphs do uh, all efficient JK dominating functions come from these uh, dominatable partitions in the same way that um, for these Hamming graphs, all of our, for at least for prime order Hamming graphs, all of our efficient K functions, K dominating functions come from um, this dominatable partition. Um, and also sort of just in playing around with the computer and, and looking at sporadic examples, um, it seems like kind of an interesting thing happens when, um, uh, you have a dominatable partition where the number of parts meets the eigenvalue bound. So again, I don't really know what to, to say about that, but it seems to me that that's an interesting um, area to pursue, at least. Um, so here are, uh, here are some papers to look at if you're interested. Um, so this paper of Van Lint uh, gives you a survey of, of the perfect code stuff that I was talking about, if, um, if you're interested. Um, this paper of Biggs is where I took the, the definition of a perfect E code in a graph. And then, uh, so this paper of Lee that I mentioned, this is, this is just a really nice paper. I've never seen this before. Um, 
until Gary points it out to me. And uh, it's just a, a very beautiful little paper um, connecting the existence of uh, efficient dominating sets in Cayley graphs to covers of the complete graph. Uh, and then there's, of course, the paper of Rubalcaba and Slater where they introduce this, this generalization of uh, efficient domination. So that's it. Thank you for uh, bearing with me so far. And thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Brendan. Are there questions for Brendan? Uh, I have a question, if, if it's okay. Absolutely. If no one else has okay, so um, Brendan, for the for the first part, just the the regular old uh, dominating set, uh, efficient dominating set problem. Um, I don't know if you mentioned this, but um, I think what you're saying is that uh, you have some solution, some L, some IP that you want to solve, and its relaxation looks very much like the negative one eigenspace of a graph. And if you have a regular graph then there is always like this fractional feasible solution of like one over the degree plus one times the L1 vector is always feasible. So the difference of these two solutions will give you a negative one eigenvector. But can't you just add this constraint to the LP like as a cutting plane and um, look at what happens to the LP when you do that? Did you understand what I said? Um. So, so definitely you can you can look at these things as integer programs and mm -hmm. all the way through. Um, that's a, a um, certainly a, a valuable avenue to, to take. Um, so if you're looking at just the, the domination problem, then you're really looking at um, uh, optimizing some function over the uh, uh, the polytope that you get. If you're looking at the, the efficient problem, then you're looking at um, you know, looking for uh, or finding integral points in some polytope. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's possible that if you just add that, uh, as you're saying, if you add the constraint. Um, that it's not some multiple of the L1's vector. Would that somehow oh, magically right, yeah, yeah, give yeah. you an LP whose optimal point is an integer point? So, uh, I, so I think if you add that constraint, what happens is um, No, so so definitely that's not the case. So you can find um, uh, regular graphs that uh, have negative one as an eigenvalue and have efficient JK dominating functions, but don't have efficient J do, uh, K do, don't have efficient dominating sets uh, or efficient K dominating sets for that for that matter. Um, so it's not quite enough just to add that cutting point. Um, uh, it's certainly something you can do that. Cool. Thanks. Any other questions? I have I have one, but it's not particularly well formed. Um, That's good. Those are my favorite questions. Great. Um, so I'm wondering if if there's any if you thought about getting any sort of intrinsic or characterization of these K covers or thinking about the K covers sort of not as, as the necessary condition to, to get these dominating sets, but it's like how they might arise in, in, in nature, how you might find them somewhere, else. not nature, but. Whatever. Yeah, I, I mean, the, those, um, if you want to know how I, I was thinking about this, um, you can almost read the slides in reverse. <laughs> I mean, right. uh, so I, I started thinking about those JK dominating functions and thinking about sort of what Crystal was mentioning, these sort of um, looking at polytopes and, and trying to find uh, integral points and then um, at some point, I sort of uh, uh, was looking at codes um, and uh, that paper of Lee, and, and then it just so happened that um, I was looking at the 11 cube and trying to, to find these uh, dominating sets that I thought should be there, and it just occurred to me that, oh, why don't I try playing around with the, um, um, these uh, um, standard basis vectors? Right. Um, and then I sort of reverse engineered my definitions from there. Um, 
so, so yeah, that's a great question. I mean, uh, along with the question, sort of the more general question of, of um, how might you go about trying to find dominatable partitions? How might you go about trying to find K covers is, um, is a certainly a good question as well. Um, yeah, it was unfortunate. So I'd, uh, in the reverse engineering, once I'd kind of hit on this idea of, of K covers, then I went back to that paper of Lee and tried to, I, I, I can definitely use this idea to generalize that paper and it'll be, it'll be a wonderful, it'll be a nice little gem of a, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> it's just, it's all bricks. <laughs> so, yeah. 